Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Wienand. I'm the um, Clinical Director of Ultra Sports Clinic. Today is a live session to give you some guidance and some information about some medical conditions that you might have. Please make sure that you use us just as guidance. If you need further help, you need to book an um, you need to book an appointment with us. We are um, at ultrasportsclinic.com or you can contact us on 0203 893 5100. So I'm very happy to take any questions, just let me know. Right, so, right, we have a question from someone. It says, hi Ash, I've been told that I have a fat pad impingement. What is this and how can I fix it? Right, so this is a good question. I get this a lot from, especially from runners. It's a knee condition. So I'm just gonna grab a model here. This is um, a knee. It happens to be a right knee, but it doesn't matter just for the purposes of what we're doing. This is your patella, all right, or your kneecap. And if we turn it around the other way, it has a little groove. And in the top of the, the knee, it has a groove here. And when you bend and straighten your knee like this, you can see that the patella glides in that groove really nicely. Now, you have a piece of fat, or what we call a fat pad, that sits underneath here. So on this bit of patella here, it sits there under the tendon. And what happens is, when you bend, it gets pinched. And it can get very inflamed, very sore. It also gets inflamed when you're bending your knee, it gets inflamed when you're kneeling, and stuff like that. So things to do with it is, you can ice it, you can put some anti-inflammatory gel on it. If it's really inflamed, um, we tend to tape it, which helps a lot. And we tend to offload it with good cushioning shoes, and we tend to try and help, um, you know, give it the best possible um, anti-inflammatory situation. So offloading, icing, cooling, you know, gel, you can take some tablets. In worst case scenario, we do inject them um, with cortisone, but it really doesn't need to be injected. So basically what we need to do is just cool it down, offload it, and they tend to improve. They do well with physio. So I'd highly recommend you come and see a physio and, um, and take it from there. Right, we've got another question from Laura. Hello, um, it's hi, I have a lower back pain. How would I know the difference between a disc and a facet joint uh, pain? Thank you. Right, so um, I've got a little model of the back here as well. So the first thing to know is that um, there are different things to know about the back. The first thing is disc pain and facet joint pain can present in the same thing. And basically what we need to do is we need to make sure that you are um, seeing someone who's medical, right? So that they can diagnose whether it's a facet joint or a disc pain. You generally don't get as much referred pain with a facet joint, but you can do. Um, you get more referred pain with a disc. So it's really important that you know the difference. If you can, I don't know if you can see on this, but you have two facet joints at the bottom of each vertebra and two at the top of each vertebra. And if I bend the vertebra open, those there articulate with the one above. Those are facet joints. Now, as you can see, you have nerves that come out the side of the spine and these are the discs in between the vertebral bodies. So what happens is when you have facet joint, if that joint is not moving nicely, it could irritate the nerve. It's very different. When you have a disc, the disc pushes onto the nerve or around the nerve and it irritates it. So it's a different thing, but the nerve does get irritated in both situations. And what really does happen is that you get this intense pain and stiffness. And if you go and see someone for a proper examination, they can then take it from that. Right, I have, patella, I have patellofemoral pain. Also, why is that? Right, so again, in the knee, patellofemoral pain is, I mean, there are lots of things that can cause patellofemoral pain. Um, one of the biggest causes is your ITB. So your iliotibial band is the band that runs from the side of your hip down to the side of your knee. And basically what can happen is it can get really, really tight and your knee cap should run in the middle of your knee like this. So when you bend and straighten the knee, it sits in that groove. Now what can happen is when you, when you have a very tight ITV that comes in and attaches down here, it can pull the patella slightly out. 
Now, uh, you can't really see it on here, but you have a groove on there and a groove in there, and that should ride in the groove. And if you are pulling the groove or the, the patella out of the groove, you are gonna get pain. So that's one cause of patellofemoral pain. I mean, there are hundreds of causes of patellofemoral pain. Um, you can have a tilted patella, you can have an inflamed, you know, um, patella, you can have cartilage uh, damage on the underside of your patella, you can have a fat pad impingement, which we talked about earlier. You can have um, all sorts of other things going on, a bit of arthritis. So it really depends on where the pain is around the patella, how long you've had it for, what you do, what you don't do, um, how, it's, how it's affecting you. Is it every day? Is it just when you stand up and walk and then it eases off? I think patella femoral pain is a very difficult one to answer without seeing anybody. But the first thing I would do is check the length of your ITV, have a look at the shoes that you're wearing to make sure that they're good and that they're well supported and that you are looking at, you know, doing the right things. And if that doesn't settle it down, then I'd come and see someone for some advice. Right, I did a chest workout this morning, not, Sorry, I did a chest workout this morning, not overly strenuous. Ironically pulled my neck, leaving the gym struggling to turn to the left, right. So sometimes what can happen is <clears throat> when you do a workout, you're, you, you can be out of alignment, you, maybe you didn't pull equally left to right, or maybe you were just tight from the night before and you did your workout and then you walked out into the cold and your muscles spasmed. So, it can be a number of things. It doesn't mean you're out of alignment. It does mean that you really need to take some time, put some heat on it or put some ice on it. Depends on which one you prefer. Generally, in this case, I'd probably go for heat first um, and gently move it left to right. See if that helps. If that doesn't help, um, I would come and be assessed. But it generally sounds like a muscle spasm. It doesn't sound like anything else. It doesn't sound like you've got any pain down the arm or any sort of joint issues going on. Um, I would just have it looked at by a physio and make sure that everything's okay. But it sounds like it's just a muscle spasm and that it will ease off with a bit of soft tissue release and some joint mobilizations that a physio can give you easily. Um, there was a shoulder question earlier on, but I think it's passed and I can't see it anymore. Uh, yeah, okay. Fine. So I think it said, um, I have a sore shoulder and how can I fix it? So again, the shoulder's a very um, difficult joint. You, you have a lot around what's going on. Just to orientate you, um, this is what we call the scapula or the shoulder blade. This is the humerus and then the clavicle, which comes across the front here. That we know is the AC joint. And the basis of the shoulder is that we want to maintain this gap. And that gap is here, okay? And what we want to do is make sure that when we move the shoulder, that gap remains and we do that by having the correct muscles activated at the right time to maintain that gap and therefore we don't crush any of these tendons or ligaments and we maintain our shoulder girdle or shoulder joint and basically what happens is when you injure your shoulder or hurt your shoulder what can sometimes happen is that rotator cuff fails and you end up injuring something that you then change the way you move or something happens and what happens is then when you move, you catch the top. And that's when you can pinch any one of the ligaments or the tendons or the muscles, or you can agitate something, or you can agitate the AC joint. Um, and that's one of the biggest causes of shoulder pain is that your shoulder's not moving well. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that you are keeping your shoulder down and back and that your shoulder is working in the proper functioning way. And you can then work it out from there again. If you've tried a couple of things and your shoulder's still sore, please don't wait. Come and see a physio, go and get some help, and um, they will assess and tell you what you need to do or not need to do. Right. I love Laura's back question. She asked you, I have low back pain. How do I know the difference between disc or facet joint, please? Please advise. I did answer this. Um, it's very difficult to know the difference between disc or facet joint. You are going to have a type of neural pain. It'll either be referred or it won't be referred. So neural pain is when pain is not 
directly over where the problem is. It might go a little bit down the leg or a little bit round the side or a little bit into the bottom. Um, and it's very difficult if you're not medically trained to tell whether it's a facet joint or disc pain. Um, generally, you get medical questions that can decipher which one is which, but what we don't want to do is we don't want to take it from one to the other. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that you get the proper medical advice so that you get the best treatment. Um, a facet joint tends to be a little easier to work on and a little easier to fix, whereas a disc might take a bit longer and you tend to have a lot more pain with the disc. But again, it just depends on the type of disc, the type of facet joint and all that sort of stuff. They both will equally give you lower back pain. Um, and unless you come in for a full medical examination, it's very difficult to say which is which just over, you know, a video or anything like that. So, um, yeah, that's probably the best way I'd explain it. Remember that the facet joint is a joint and the disc is a cartilaginous ring with sort of a jelly type substance on the middle and that works as a shock absorber from left to right. So as you move, the shock absorption will, you know, be distributed through the disc. And if the disc isn't working properly, it, you know, it will overload it in one way or it has a problem, you know, then you can form a disc problem. So it's, it's really difficult to say um, without examining someone whether they facet joint or disc. It really comes down to the type of pain that they display or anything like that. Yeah. All right, so any other questions for me, I'm happy to answer. Um, no? All right. So just to tell you a little bit about our clinic, um, we're situated on 72 King William Street, which is between Bank and Monument, which is really easy and handy to get to. It's just off London Bridge, um, adjacent to Cannon Street. Uh, so we're about a two minute walk from Monument, a five minute walk from Bank, um, we're probably a eight minute walk from London Bridge and probably a five minute walk from Cannon Street um, train station so we're nicely situated. We've got a, a lovely MDT here. We have um, six physios, a chiropractor, a biokineticist. For those of you who don't know what a biokineticist is, she's a um, movement and strength rehab specialist. So in South Africa it's a five year degree in rehab. Uh, they sort of the guru in rehab which is really nice. So post-surgery you would come and see a physio and when you had finished your physio um, you would then go and see a biokineticist for your rehab that would then take you back into your sporting arena or back into your gym. Uh, we have a consultant radiologist who does ultrasound guided injections on a Thursday. Uh, we charge 300 quid for an uh, ultrasound and an injection which is really reasonable and it's done by a consultant which is fantastic. Uh, Consultant radiologist, not even just a consultant physio, which is fantastic. Right, we have another question here. I rolled my ankle six weeks ago. It's still stiff across the front of the ankle. And restricting, so it's across the front and restricting, okay. Um, thought it should have healed by now. Why is that and what can I do? All right, so. Here's one thing, when you roll someone's ankle, well, when you roll your ankle, you wanna make sure um, that you haven't just rolled it, you haven't done any more damage to it, okay? So is it very puffy? Is it blue? Um, is it bruised? Is it, you know, very difficult to walk on? I think you need to assess this, and then, you know, have you maybe broken something? Have you torn a ligament, something like that? So there are a couple of things that we would look at. Um, when you came to come see a physio. So let's say you're out in the middle of nowhere camping and you roll your ankle and it's very, very sore. The first thing you need to do is get ice and compression on it immediately and get it elevated. So your normal price um, routine would, would suffice. Um, if you were unable to weight bear or unable to put weight through your ankle, um, I would absolutely take every precaution to go to A&E and check for, um, have a check x-ray and, and make sure that there's no break. If you are able to weight bear on it and you've got some strapping tape or something that, like maybe an ankle brace that you can immobilize your ankle with, this would be a good plan. And make sure that you are using what you need to use to, you know, um, keep the ankle supported. Um, if you've ruptured or torn something, you will generally get a lot of bruising. Now, there are many ligaments and structures around the ankle that can tear 
when you roll your ankle really badly. Um, what you want to avoid is a fracture. So it's very important that if you've had a bad ankle sprain and it's been very bruised and very swollen and it isn't settling and it's about six to eight weeks, maybe, maybe a bit more, 12 weeks, and it's still not settling, there is a small chance that you might have a, um, an ankle fracture. Or you know you might have a, a just a tip of the the medialis that's come off. You might have just broken a small bone. You might have broken a toe. Something can happen that you might not be aware of. It could be an undisplaced fracture, just a hairline fracture. So I think it's really important that if you're not healing, don't just push it aside. You really do need to see someone who knows what they're talking about, and they can send you for either a check X-ray or an MRI, and they can make sure that you are doing what you have to do and make sure that you are not putting yourself at risk. Because an undisplaced fracture that doesn't heal causes a lot of problems. Um, so let's say you are somewhere in, in camping and you roll your ankle and then you've got some ice and you elevate, and you compress it and you strap it and your ankle settles, but then it's very unstable. Chances are you tore a ligament somewhere along the road and now you need to rehab your ankle, which means you need to rebalance it, you need to use all those intrinsic muscles and get them stimulated again. You need to stand on one leg with your knee bent and balance, and you need to retrain those small muscles to take over where that ligament might not be there anymore, um, or might be partially torn. And so you rework the ankle, and that's where you need to come see a physio or a biokineticist or someone like that who can give you that advice and those exercises so that you can make sure that you are giving your ankle the best chance to recover properly. As I said before, if your ankle is not recovering and you're getting very sore, be really, really careful um, that you just might have a fracture. So if you come in and have a look with a, a good physio or someone like that, they'll be able to tell and send you to the right people to, to double check. Um, if it is a fracture, you'll probably be put in a boot or if not, if it's healing, then we'll just expect a longer healing recovery and then you go into the rehab same as before uh, with the balancing and the strengthening and everything else like that. Right, we have another question. I have pain when I bend my knee. It feels like there is a pocket of fluid behind the knee. Okay, so basically what happens is you can get um, what we call a Baker's cyst behind the back of the knee, which is an area of fluid that fills behind the back of the knee. That is one example of why there's fluid behind the back of the knee. Um, you can get all sorts of other reasons why your knee might be swollen behind. You might find that um, you have some extracapsular swelling in the knee or some intracapsular swelling. You might have injured your calf muscle, which has made it more bulky. So when you, when you bend your knee, you feel that it's more restricted. Um, but generally, it, it's roughly around a swelling area or a swelling condition. Um, again, difficult to say if we haven't examined you and haven't had a look at you, but there is a good chance that um, if you're struggling to bend your knee, it could be anything from swelling behind the knee to, you know, a cartilage. Um, really just have to make sure that everything's in place. So you're, you haven't got an ACL tear or problem there, you haven't got a PCL problem, your meniscus is fine. Um, we would check your lateral and medial collateral ligaments. Uh, and then we would look at your gastrox and soleus head from behind uh, to make sure that that was fine. And then your popliteal that can make things um, a bit tight and a bit sore. Um, so again, I would, I would encourage you to come in and, and see a physio. Uh, but generally, if you can see a swelling behind the back of the knee, it could be a vagus cyst. Put some ice on it um, and seek some help because although you know there's no problem with having one, they can be quite irritating. And if you're a gym going type person and you do a lot of squatting and that sort of stuff, they can be very um, disruptive in, in your workout. So, or if you're a runner or anything like that. So yeah, it's, it's definitely worth um, coming in and, and getting a look at. Right, is there an ideal setup for the office desk? Do you have recommendations to sit or, stand, or a standing desk? It's a great question, okay? So we get asked this all the time. Sitting or standing, what's better, what's not better? I think, I think the big thing to say here is what's comfortable for you. And if you're set up properly, whether you're sitting or whether you're standing, I think it's really, really, really important that you make sure that it's right for you, okay? Now, as a physio, we stand a lot all day long, but we use the materials and the tools around us to make sure that we're standing at the right height and the right level and 
stuff like that. And I think the big thing to note here is that if you are used to standing, then you can stand. If you're not used to standing, you can't stand all day. And if you're not standing in the right shoes, you can't stand all day. So I generally say to my patients, if you can, try and sit for 40 minutes to an hour, maybe an hour and a half, and then stand for 40 minutes to an hour. Something like that. If you can alternate, that's my favorite but, you know, uh, advice. But I would say the guidance that I would give anybody in standing is watch that you're not looking down, okay? Because this is gonna affect your neck. So you really don't wanna be looking down on your screen. You wanna be looking straight at your screen. You don't wanna be doing any of this, no protrusion of the chin, okay? You wanna keep your chin nice and back. You don't wanna be looking forwards. You wanna just be in good alignment down the spine. And then, you know, your, your, your actual um, typing should be at a decent level so that your arms are rested by your side and that you're at 90 degrees through your elbow and your wrist is slightly higher. It's the same with sitting. You want to be close enough to your desk. You want to be well back in your chair so that you're using the support of your chair. You don't want to be sitting on the edge of your chair so you can easily hunch over and throw that chin forwards again. Bring your mouse close to you. Bring your computer close to you. Bring your chair close to the desk. Sit in good alignment, pull your, elbow, your um, shoulders back and down, make sure that your chin is nicely tucked in and that you're looking straight at your screen. Again, you don't want to look down, you don't want to look up, you don't want to look to the sides. You know, some of my traders, they've got eight or nine screens, you know, they're looking up and down everywhere, but they're moving constantly. And I think that's the difference. Stagnant causes problems. You really need to move. So if you're gonna stand, stand and then sit. And if you're going to sit, then stand. And if you can only sit or only stand, go walk. Go get yourself some water. Go out for lunch. Go and do the things. Go to the, the printer. Go and pick up things. Don't just stay stagnant. Because if you stay stagnant, you're going to get sore. And you end up in a very slouched position. Um, and one of my favorite games to do is to get colleagues to take photographs of each other, sitting at their desks, desks or standing at their desks, and then they show them to each other. And it's like, it's called the busted moment. So you bust someone um, in a bad or poor position. And I think once you visually see what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, you actually get a better idea of how you're doing and why you're doing it. And then you can correct yourself quite easily. I've got another great little trick where I tell the key, so like a little orange dot or a, uh, I don't know, a little heart or whatever you fancy, it doesn't really matter, unicorn or Whatever. and you stick one on your computer screen, you stick one on your car keys, your house keys, your, your tube uh, pass, anything that you use on a daily basis. And then basically what you do is every time you see it, you think, oh, how am I sitting? How am I standing? You know, um, it, it really just depends on how, how you want to do it, but it will remind you to check yourself out. Uh, and I think that's sort of the right sort of tips on sitting and standing. Um, remember that HR have a responsibility to help you uh, set up your desk properly um, and I think it's really good that people do do that if they're struggling. I think one of the biggest things now is we have hot desking and we really struggle to, you know, we have to put everything away at the end of the day, we don't go to the same desk, how do you set it up? Well just take a little notebook and take a mental note of how high you like your screen, how high you like your chair, where do you like it, where don't you like it and very quickly you'll learn how to put your desk and chair back in place. And, you know, it's these little tips and techniques that, you know, we can give you or you can learn. And um, you generally do much better once you have these uh, down pads. Yeah. Right, we've got another question. I have a cart, I have my cartilage in my knee. I had my cartilage in my knee repaired last year, September. I was wondering when I can start running again. Well, I mean, that's a very good question. So you would have had an arthroscopy where they took a piece of cartilage out. Um, you would have done your rehab afterwards and done your time with your physio. Uh, September last year, so it's nearly a year. You would have been doing some impact um, exercises, so some jumping and some hopping and some skipping and those sort of things already with your physio or your biokinesis. Um, and so I'd probably say that what we normally would say is that you could have run a long time ago, but you can start running now, why not? Uh, first things first, get a great pair of shoes. So go and have yourself properly assessed by someone who can do a great good uh, gait analysis um, and will give you the right pair of shoes because what you used to run in may not be correct for you now. And they might be old and they might not be you know good. So definitely go and get yourself a new pair of shoes. That's number one. Number two, start slow. 
don't go and run five kilometers. Okay, so we do a little walk run program for 10 minutes. Walk one minute, run one minute, and so on and so forth for 10 minutes. And then every time you add to that two minutes, so one run and one walk. And then when, when you hit 20 minutes, you can then run for five minutes, walk for two minutes, run for five minutes, and so you're running for 10 minutes. And then basically we build that up until we hit 20 minutes. And then, so you then would run for seven minutes, walk for two, run for seven, so it's 14 minutes of running, until you get to 20. And then I allow my patients to run for 20, walk for two, all right? And then see how you feel, and then we start adding on to that. So run for 22, run for 24, etc., etc. So it just builds you up really nice and slowly. And this is done over several weeks, um, probably two months to get you up to 20 minutes, depending on how fit you are, depending on the type of um, pain you have. If you have any pain or swelling, you need to slow it back down and go back a few steps and then move forwards again. But there's no reason if your knee is in good shape and the operation went really well and you haven't had any pain since and you've done all your rehab, why you can't start running now. Okay. Personal, tra personal trainers uh, keep telling me I need to improve my core strength. Why? You know, core strength is, is the crux of what we do, right? So you want to throw a ball, you take your arm back and you throw a ball, but it really comes from your core control. So what you do with your stomach muscles and your glute muscles um, can control how fast you can throw a ball. If you want to walk forwards, you have to stabilize your pelvis from your core. Everything you do, you have to have, ensure that you have a strong core so that you can work the upper part of your body and the lower part of your body off that stable base. So it's really about making a stable base um, and creating a system where you can work both sides. What I really want to stress is that your core is not just the six pack, okay? It's got to do with spinal segmental control. So being able to flatten your back and hold that neutral spinal position while doing something is good core control. So you must not just think that doing sit-ups is the way to get spinal control. That is not the case. You need to do types of Pilates exercises and type of physio exercises, and all of this will build the entire core. You don't just want to build the six-pack. If you have a six-pack, it does not mean that you are strong. It means that you have a defined body. Okay, to be strong, you need to be able to hold your spine in neutral while doing things. And there's a big difference between them. Okay, I have been diagnosed with tennis elbow. Will I be able to play tennis again? If so, how long will it take me? All right, so tennis elbow is what we call um, epicondylitis. So it is the inflammation of the common extensor tendon. So basically on your arm, it's in this area here and it's where all the tendons come from the hand and they attach up here. And it's an inflammation of that area. So yes, you will be able to play tennis again. Um, you will need treatment. So come and see a good physio and get some good treatment. Uh, you need to ice the area down. You need to stretch the hand um, and the forearm off. Uh, you need to retrain the forearm with strength and, and conditioning. Um, in very specific and, and certain exercises which a physio or bio can teach you. Um, I love putting anti-inflammatory gel on them because I think it does really well. Anti-inflammatory gel normally absorbs about two centimeters into the body, which is perfect for this. Um, they, they are uh, tricky and they do take a long time. You get very, very nice braces for them. Um, so yeah, I'd say that's about right, but you'd definitely be able to play again, but you'd need the help and you'd absolutely need to see a physio and, and know what's going on. Right guys, that's all we have time for today. Thanks so much, it's been really great. Um, and look forward to our next one where we are having our sports masseuses come on board and they'll be telling you about what they do and where they come from and uh, the types of technique, the techniques that they use and all the good stuff that they can do for you, especially those triathletes, Ironmen, and all those uh, Tough Mudders and everything, you know, the Ride 100s. You know, when should you have a massage? When shouldn't you have a massage? Um, what should you be doing and not doing? So thanks again and see you soon.